In the 1630s, Fermat conjectured that 2 to the 2 to the n plus 1 is always prime for every non-negative integer n. So if you try the first few cases, it seems to work. We get 3, which is prime. 5, that's a prime. 17, that's a prime. 257, which is prime. And n equals 4 gives 65,537, which is trickier to check, but it's also a prime. Now if we let n equal 5, we get a very, very big number, roughly 4 billion. And it certainly isn't clear if that's a prime. Fermat didn't know, and actually... At the time, mathematicians didn't even know any primes bigger than a million, so it would be basically impossible to check every possible prime divisor up to the square root of this number. So it seemed like a hopeless problem, and it was for about 100 years. But then, in 1732, none other than Euler came along, and he found a factorization. So he found that it factors as a product of two primes, the smaller one of which is 641. Now he didn't actually show that the other factor is prime, but some people think that he might have shown it, he just didn't write it down anywhere. He did have the tools to prove it, and we'll see in a little bit how one could prove this without checking the first several hundred prime numbers. And on top of that, in the same paper, Euler found some factors of some other even bigger numbers. For example, 2 to the 37th minus 1 is divisible by 223. 2 to the 43rd minus 1 is divisible by 431. And 2 to the 73rd minus 1 is divisible by 439. Now, he didn't actually write out these other factors. He just found these smallish prime factors. And then, well, he didn't have the tools to check those other numbers for primality. And they aren't all prime anyway. So... It would take a lot more work to factor those, but anyway, he found some of the factors, and he handled one even bigger number, which was 6 to the 128th plus 1, which is a 100-digit number, and he found that 257 is a factor of that, and needless to say, the other factor is ridiculously big. Too big to really even bother computing, even if you wanted to. So these big numbers fall into two categories, Fermat numbers and Mersenne numbers. Fermat numbers come about when looking for primes that are one more than a power of two. So if we have a prime that's one more than a power of two, it turns out that the exponent always has to be itself a power of two. So if it weren't, what that would mean is that we could write the exponent as a product of two numbers where one of them is an odd number larger than one. And that means that we could write two to the k plus one as a sum of odd powers, and we can factor that. So two to the a b plus one, we can factor out two to the a plus one, and then there's this other big nasty factor. But the important part is that it can't be prime. So for example, if a is 4 and b is 7, we find that 2 to the 28th plus 1 is divisible by 17. So what that means is that if we're looking for primes that are one more than a power of 2, the only exponents we should check are themselves the powers of 2. Mersenne numbers are similar, except it's a power of 2 minus 1. So if we want that to be prime, we can do a similar trick with a difference of powers. So if k is not a prime, we can write k as a product of two smaller numbers and then factor that as a difference of powers. 
and since our factors a and b are both larger than one we get a factorization where one factor is two to the a minus one and the other is some big number that's uh, larger than one so we have a non-trivial factorization and that means it can't be prime so for example 2 to the 65th minus 1 is divisible by 2 to the 5th minus 1 and also 2 to the 13th minus 1. So if we're looking for primes that are 1 less than a power of 2, the only exponents we should check are themselves prime. Now that doesn't mean that every single exponent with these properties will work, of course. So although it works for small examples, it fails for a large one. So we just saw an example where 2 to the 32 plus 1 is not prime. And with Mersenne primes, you can let k be 11 and 2047 will not be a prime. Now the same argument we used for Fermat numbers works no matter what the base is as long as it's even. It won't work if a is odd because then you're working with an even number, so that won't be prime. With the Mersenne numbers, we can't really change the 2 to any other number because we write it as a difference of powers, and then a to the k minus 1 is always divisible by a minus 1. So there's no way that's going to be prime unless a is 2, because then the factor is 1, and that doesn't give us a factorization that would force the number to be composite. Now the key to finding these massive factorizations is, appropriately enough, Fermat's Little Theorem. Even though it's called Fermat's Little Theorem though, Fermat did not prove it. Like many other statements he made, he did not prove it, he just said it and stated it as if it were true. The first published proof was actually by Euler about a hundred years later. Although Leibniz seems to have written an unpublished proof of it in the late 1600s. So the theorem says that if we take any prime p and a positive integer not divisible by p and we raise it to the power p minus 1, we always get something that's 1 mod p. Now actually Fermat wrote a statement that was a little bit stronger and this turns out to be exactly what we need to factor these big numbers. So not only is a to the p minus 1 always 1 mod p, but in fact, if we look at the least exponent that we need to raise a to to get 1, that's always a divisor of p minus 1. So a to the p minus 1 is always 1, but there may be some smaller power we can use, and that smaller power, whatever it is, will always go into p minus 1. So as an example, Fermat looks at the powers of 3 and reduces mod 13. So 13 goes into 26. So 27 is already 1 mod 13. So 3 to the 12th would be 1 mod 13 automatically, but 3 cubed is actually enough in this case. But then this means that actually whenever the exponent is a multiple of 3, we'll also get 1 mod 13. So to prove this, well, we're going to take Fermat's little theorem as a given. We could prove that as well, but the main point is this extra detail, which is that the least exponent k always divides p minus 1. So take any prime p and any a that's not divisible by p, and take the smallest positive integer so that a to the d is 1 mod p. We know that some power will work there because p minus 1 will work, but there may be a smaller one. So what this means is that if we look at the powers of a mod p, they're forced to cycle and the period of that sequence will be exactly d. That's how long it takes to get back around to where we started at a to the 0. So we can visualize this as powers going around a circle and then there will be exactly d points around the circle, and we'll keep looping around and around and around. Okay, so you get the idea. I can't draw 
every single power, but we keep getting cycles of length d. And now using Fermat's little theorem, we know that a to the p minus 1 is 1 mod p. So after p minus 1 steps, we're back to where we started. But from this picture, we know that we can only get back to where we started if the number of steps we've gone is a multiple of d. So that means that d goes evenly into p minus 1. And that's the proof. So this least integer that gets us to 1 is called the order of a mod p. And it's sometimes written ord sub p of a. So we've shown that the order of a mod p is always a divisor of p minus 1. And now this is what allows us to factor these massive numbers. So for example, let's go back to the example of 2 to the 32 plus 1. And say we have a prime divisor of it. So call that prime divisor p. Then we can write this as a congruence. So we can write it as 2 to the 32 is negative 1 mod p. And if we square both sides, we get 2 to the 64 is 1 mod p. So it means that the length of the cycle, the order, has to go evenly into 64. So the order divides 64, but the order cannot be a divisor of 32 because that would force 2 to the 32 to be 1 mod p, but it isn't. It's minus 1. So it takes exactly 64 steps to get back to 1. And from what we just proved, we know that that goes evenly into p minus 1. OK, so in other words, any prime divisor of this number is 1 mod 64. So that narrows down considerably the primes we have to test. So let's list out the first 10 numbers that are 1 mod 64. So we get this list. And first of all, we can get rid of the numbers that aren't prime in this list right away because we're only interested in prime factors. So that gets rid of five of the possibilities already. And then we just have to test these five numbers. And sure enough, the first four don't work. But the first one that does work is 641. And now, if Euler did a bit of extra work, which he may or may not have done, he could have divided 641 out of this big number and gotten that 6 million, roughly, number. And then, again, the prime divisors of that number are all 1 mod 64. So he could keep testing primes up to the square root of that, which would only be a few thousand. And so he actually did a good chunk of the work toward factoring that 6.7 million number as well. Although he didn't write down explicitly whether he thought it was prime or whether he proved it was prime or anything like that. But that number was actually 10 times bigger than the largest known prime at the time. So it would have shattered that record. And in fact, Euler later broke that record again by a much bigger margin uh, using the same idea with Mersenne primes. So that's the trick for Fermat primes. If we take any prime divisor of 2 to the 2 to the n plus 1, it's always going to be 1 mod 2 to the n plus 1. And then actually in the 19th century, Luca strengthened this a bit to primes being 1 mod 2 to the n plus 2. So there's an extra factor of 2 there using quadratic reciprocity, which takes quite a bit more work. But that cuts down on the amount of work needed yet again. And the same idea works for Mersenne numbers as well. If we take q to be a prime divisor of 2 to the p minus 1, and remember, p is prime, so we can write 2 to the p congruent to 1 mod q. And so the order of 2 mod q must go evenly into p. But p is a prime, so the only factors of it are 1 and p. 
but the order cannot be one. That would mean that two is already one mod q. That doesn't make sense. So the order must be p. So we can say that q is one mod p using the result we just proved. And we can strengthen that a little bit by saying that q is one mod two p because q is always odd and p is odd. So we might as well combine 1 mod p and 1 mod 2 into 1 mod 2p. All right, now let's go back to that original list of huge numbers. So I have highlighted the exponents in green and the small, well, relatively small prime factors in blue. And in each case, sure enough, that prime factor is always one more than a multiple of twice the exponent. So 641 is 1 mod 64, 223 is 1 mod 74, and so on. So this gives us a relatively fast way of checking for prime factors. Now, Euler did get very lucky with these numbers because when we're dealing with numbers this big, the prime factors will usually be much, much bigger than this. So actually in the same paper where Euler mentions these five numbers, he conjectures that two to the 41 minus one and two to the 47 minus one are both prime, but unfortunately they're not. It's just that the factors of them are so big that even with this trick, you would have to be very patient to find any of the factors. So two to the 41 minus one is a product of two giant primes and two to the 47 minus one is a product of three slightly smaller, but still pretty giant primes. So this method isn't foolproof. It still takes some work in many cases, but it at least allows one to narrow down the possibilities considerably. And these kinds of ideas ended up being fundamental to finding large primes for the next few hundred years.